This week, Spaceport America, super fast weather satellites, and using VR to understand cancer treatment and recovery. Fifty years after the first humans landed on the moon, a new space race is underway. But today, it's not just nations that are competing to put ships and people into space. Private companies are getting in on it too. In fact, they're leading the charge. Elon Musk's SpaceX already delivers cargo to the ISS and is now one of several companies exploring the notion of space tourism, putting non-professional astronauts into space. It's already signed up billionaire Yusaku Maizawa to take a trip around the moon. Amazon boss and the world's richest man, Jeff Bezos, is also planning to take passengers to the edge of space with his company, Blue Origin, by the end of 2019 and has ambitions to land humans on the moon by 2024. But there is one company that's further along the space tourism journey than any other. And now Virgin Galactic has opened the doors to its new HQ and given Mark Chislak exclusive access. It's a little after 7 a.m. and I'm heading into the desert in New Mexico, about 20 miles past a place called Truth or Consequences. The reason for that really early start is that we are going to get a very rare glimpse inside that. It bills itself as the world's very first commercial spaceport. Thank you very much. Thank you. The only way that you can get to space today is with the Russians. And they're currently charging NASA around $80 million a ticket. Spaceport America is the new home of Virgin Galactic, the company founded by billionaire Sir Richard Branson to take paying customers on 90-minute flights to the edge of space. The spaceport's exterior is the product of British architects Foster & Partners. Eventually, five spaceships and two carrier aircraft will reside in the hangar. Passengers will also receive three days training here before blasting off into the upper atmosphere. And spaceship from base, you are go for L minus 10 on top. It's also home to Mission Control, where all flight operations are monitored from. And this is the very first time a TV crew has been allowed to film inside this room. I'm the winds are holding 160 at 10 knots, I'll turn 3013. Virgin Galactic has moved all of its operations to New Mexico from its original base in Mojave, California. The White Knight 2 mothership aircraft has already moved in and continues flight testing, but the actual spacecraft, dubbed Spaceship 2, will arrive at Spaceport America at a later date. The White Knight carrier aircraft is really performing a rehearsal for a real space flight. It's going to ascend to the altitude where it would normally release the spaceship, perform a few manoeuvres and then come back round to land on this runway. Scotsman Dave Mackay is Virgin Galactic's chief pilot. He takes me for a drive along the spaceport's two-mile runway. This is something that I've wanted to do all my life. I wanted to be an astronaut, I wanted to go to space. Dave successfully completed a space flight earlier this year and has been awarded his commercial astronaut's wings. Welcome to the club, astronaut. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. I, like, right. I like this club. What's the spaceship like to fly? The uh, spacecraft is, uh, is amazing to fly. At launch, we're, we're sitting underneath uh, White Knight 2. 
at release, it's like going over the top of a roller coaster, so you get this lightness in your stomach, which is nice. One, release, release, release. You haven't lit the rocker motor yet, so there's silence just for a few seconds. We light the rocker motor. Fire, fire! So we accelerate away within a few seconds, we go through the, the sound batter, go Mach 1. Great motor burn, everybody. We're going to space. The sky goes from a blue to a very dark blue to black in what seems like you know, a few seconds. Immediately after shutdown, you're in weightlessness. At that point, we're going to allow the customers to unstrap. At the end of boost, you're there. Uh, with no forces on your body, no motion, because it, the vehicle is just sitting there, and no sound. Now we're coming back down in this feathered configuration. Now we're a glider, and uh, we've got about uh, 15 to 20 minutes of uh, gliding to come back down and land at uh, spaceport. So different to really what I expected. Uh, I just, you know, that, those are the words that came out of my mouth. This is unreal, you know, it just seemed astonishing. The, the curvature of the Earth, that you see so much of it that you now get a sense of scale of the size of the planet. And, and in the meantime, you're looking out in this blackness of space and you can't help but think, well, what else is out there? I think uh, something that a lot of people will take away with them after their space flight is how thin the atmosphere is and how important it is to look after it. So far, over 600 people have signed up to take a flight with Virgin Galactic, with tickets costing £200,000. But at a time of increased concern about the environment, is it responsible to send wealthy people to space for fun? Thank you, Richard. Actually, the environmental impact, the CO2 impact of this vehicle is, is much less than you would think. By air launching it, and um, because it's so small and uses carbon fiber, we actually don't have a very big rocket motor in the back. And so the per person CO2 emissions is on, for the average flight, around that of a uh, business class flight from New York to the UK. There's an awareness of our planet documented scientifically with astronauts. They come back changed with a greater realization of the fragility of our ecosystem and ecosphere. The irony of this idea isn't lost on space experts, though. The fact that they have to go that far into space above the planet to have that emotion of feeling protective over the world that they live in is sort of ridiculous. But you have to put it into perspective of the fact that Space travel is very limited in how much it actually contributes to CO2 emissions. Comparison to aircraft, it's a tiny fraction of what aircraft put out there. There have been delays and setbacks for Virgin Galactic. In 2014, one of its spacecraft crashed during flight testing, resulting in the death of its co-pilot and serious injuries for the pilot. Dave Mackay acknowledges the time that testing is taking. So you, if you look at military test programs, then the risk levels are, are, are different. You know, we're, we're building a safe, reliable commercial system. It's very, very different to anything that's been done before. But we still have some more flights to do with more people in the back. And uh, once we've done a few more of those flights, we'll be ready to start commercial operations. So we're, we're getting very close. Uh, it has taken longer than I guess we, we thought it would do initially. But I don't think, with hindsight, I don't think that's at all surprising. On paper, space tourism can seem a bit frivolous, but we're moving into an era of commercialization of space travel anyway. Most government-funded experiments in space, either on the space station or probes to other planets, are going to be shipped out to commercial companies. And so furthering space travel in that sense is actually going to benefit from space tourism as well. So we have to take into account not just the impact of space tourism in the sense of our economy, but also the impact on the life-changing event that the people who will be on those planes will go through and the impact they'll then have when they return to Earth. When do you think Virgin Galactic is going to be putting paying customers up into space? When is the date? When is that going to happen? Right now, according to our current projections, we think that we can uh, start commercial operations next year. 
So the race is on. Space could be about to get a lot more crowded. For those that can afford the price of a ticket, of course. Wow, that was Mark. This is Mark. How was your trip to almost space? It's great. It's difficult not to get excited <laughs> by spaceships. Yeah, so we've got Amazon doing Blue Origin. We've got SpaceX doing a variety of space tourism projects. And now we have Virgin Galactic as well. They look like they've got the most advanced proposition, but how would you rate these different companies at the moment? They're all completely different and they all have their own advantages, their plus points. But, you know, Virgin's got a spaceport that's pretty much up and running. Looking at sort of Blue Origin's idea, Jeff Bezos is suggesting that they ha their capsule might be autonomous. So it might actually launch, the capsule will detach with all of the space tourists inside. They'll get to look out of the windows and yeah. see the Earth and then it'll land back down on Earth. But with no pilot. Without a pilot. Mm. Now, I've got, <laughs> I've got an Amazon Echo and, and Alexa can barely understand me. So whether the company behind that technology, whether I will trust them to send me to space or not <laughs> autonomously, I don't know. I really, really don't know. To be fair though, SpaceX are launching rockets and landing them autonomously as yes, well. They are. Yes, they are. Yeah. So, in, in, all, in, all, in all fairness. There is talk that they might be building one or even more spaceports here in the UK. Yes, is there that, is. Is that a realistic goal? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of chatter about um, spaceports being built in the UK. The most serious one is probably the Cornwall project. So a runway, a runway project. Uh, so it'd be very similar to what we saw out in New Mexico. So um, aircraft launched space vehicles. So something like um, launching from Virgin Orbit with a, with a big 7 with a rocket underneath the wing or something like the White Knight 2 mothership. That looks as if um, it's, it's a go. That looks as if it could happen, but not for quite a long time right. yet. Okay. The second project is up in Scotland, and that is more likely to be a traditional rocket launched uh, rocket launch facility. So just rockets that go straight up, no runway. OK, Mark, cheers. Hello, and welcome to the week in tech. It was the week that Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey had his own account hacked. The profile, which has more than 4 million followers, posted a flurry of racist tweets for about 15 minutes. PayPal suspended an account in the United States being used to raise funds for the Ku Klux Klan. And Facebook has said it is considering testing hiding likes, following a similar experiment on Instagram in August. Details of a full-scale rollout haven't been revealed. Now, it may not be the most efficient way to send mail, but a British inventor has delivered a letter from the UK mainland to the Isle of Wight, wearing a jet engine powered suit, 85 years after the idea of Rocket Post failed. Richard Browning has followed in the footsteps of German entrepreneur Gerhard Zucker, who tried to send mail by rocket to the island in 1934. Researchers at MIT have developed a new robotic thread that could help treat blood clots in stroke patients. The thread is steered through blood vessels by magnets instead of the current hand-operated method, potentially making it safer for both patients and surgeons. It's hoped in the future procedures could even be carried out remotely. And finally, is that Obi-Wan Bon Jovi? Nope, it's the Lego Droid Orchestra. Conductor and programmer Sam Battle took 3,000 hours assembling 30 iPads, 46 R2-D2s, 25 gonks and 24 mouse droids to recreate the iconic Star Wars theme. A truly stellar performance. In the UK, one in two of us will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in our lifetimes. That is a terrifying statistic. Yet unless you or someone close to you has been through it, it can be hard to really comprehend the experience. And whilst everybody's journey is different, one woman has made a VR experience to illustrate hers. It is uh, the last chemo today. BAFTA award-winning filmmaker Victoria Mapplebeck has created The Waiting Room. Combining a smartphone shot video documentary and this virtual reality experience, she aims to fully immerse the audience in the unnerving position of being up close and personal with cancer diagnosis, treatment and, in this case, recovery. 
I wanted to make visible the often invisible parts of cancer treatment, the hair loss and the nausea and the fear and the effect on family. This reconstruction of Victoria's final radiotherapy session is combined with a CGI journey through her body, looking at the cancer cells and what CT scans, mammograms and ultrasounds found. When the experience first starts, you can initially feel as though you are actually the patient. Then when you look down, you realise you're not, you're a fly on the wall. What made you want to do this as somebody looking at what was going on rather than being the person experiencing it? So we did at the beginning of the project think very hard about did we want it to be an embodied experience where effectively you are the patient and I felt quite uncomfortable with that and I wanted instead to sort of create a kind of fly on the wall perspective. You feel that it's very intimate, you feel that you're looking right down on me, almost next to me. What were the benefits that you felt there were in conveying this in virtual reality? So in flat film, you're in the cinema and you're looking at the kind of uh, what's happening to the characters, what's happening to the story. You're not necessarily thinking about your own position within that. With VR, you're almost thinking, who am I? What am I doing in this space? This was shot on a head-mounted GoPro. Some more interactive elements, like allowing the user to hear their own heartbeat and breath, have been trialled. But I agreed with Victoria's conclusion that they were actually distracting. Midway through chemo, I ask my oncologist if they still have my tumour samples. When it came to sound, though, subtle effects could convey profound meaning. Oh, hi, yeah, it's just that. Um, if, if you would like that. We have the actual sound of the scene with the nurses around you and you hear them around you as they are. So we, we created this relationship compass of um, voices. So we have her son in the center of her life, then we have the father is basically on the right hand side in the back on the opposite side of the mom. Then we have uh, to the left and to the right we have her brothers. We feel you have a better chance. Then we have Mr. Garg, the oncologist, which is basically a little bit above the sun because he's also right in this situation in the center of her life. Wow. That was quite something. Amazing storytelling, but also I think the thing that really, really stood out to me was a feeling of loneliness, of being really isolated in being the person who has cancer, going through all that treatment where your life sort of enters another zone and hearing all the voices of friends, of family, of medical experts, but still feeling quite lonely inside. Oh God, it is. It's more than I thought. Victoria came to make this, feeling there wasn't enough out there from the patient's perspective. And now she's hoping for funding to take the project to hospitals and cancer centres to share her experience. Satellites. They're always up there, watching us, connecting us, guiding us. But it's an expensive business. Building a satellite costs a lot. Getting it into orbit costs even more. That was until 1999, when two engineers invented the idea of the CubeSat, a cheap, standardised mini-satellite that could be fitted into the spare space around other payloads in a rocket. Suddenly, you didn't have to organise your own launch. You could just hitch a ride on someone else's. And that made satellites available to places that could never have afforded them before. Small companies, researchers, and even university students. We basically took this approach of giving them minimum resources so they cannot do anything too complicated. And then you standardize it and make it small. So two things happen. One is cheap and easy to put on a rocket. And second, you have a lot of people building the same thing. So now we have numbers behind us before every university was trying to launch their own spacecraft. The industry is now worth hundreds of millions of pounds. And over the years, we've looked at CubeSats that observe the ocean, the land, and may just create fireworks for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. And to help mark the 20th anniversary of this remarkable invention, we've sent meteorologist Peter Gibbs to find out about the latest edition, an all-new weather CubeSat. 
The River Clyde here in Glasgow used to be one of the main shipbuilding centres in the world. That's now long gone, but they're building a different kind of ship here now, spaceships. Just up the road, they're putting together a revolutionary new kind of weather satellite, and that's what I'm here to see. Clyde Space is one of the companies who have built some of the nearly 2,000 CubeSats launched into space in the last two decades. Now, as a meteorologist and a bit of a space fan, I'm really excited to see the tech that could potentially improve weather forecasting. But before I get a chance to get near a CubeSat, well, I have to look a little ridiculous. So this is a basic CubeSat unit, just 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres, packed with electronics, you can see the solar panels on the side. If you need something bigger, you can just add more units to whatever size you need. It's a fantastic innovation. One thing that's really clever about these CubeSat satellites is their adaptability. So we've got a standard chassis, we've got some solar panels there, we've got electronics units. These are all off the shelf into the satellite yep. and then the customer can put their own bespoke bit of kit into that but get it into space much quicker. Yep. Absolutely, so you can see from these systems they're a uniform size. Those stack up into uh, what we call the avionics stack and within the structure itself, this is a common structure, what we call a six unit and within that you can see this avionics stack will only take up a certain amount of the volume and that leaves us with a huge amount of uh, space to stick in whatever it is we want to provide those data products and services uh, in, in addition to that. US company Orbital Microsystems has been working with Clyde Space to launch a prototype satellite to measure weather using something called a microwave radiometer. Now these things are normally the size of a coffee table and hugely expensive, but OMS have developed their own much cheaper miniature version. They aim to provide and sell weather updates every 15 minutes from a constellation of 40 CubeSats, and that's compared to the three-hour updates from the smaller number of big government-run satellites. But that extra data could improve the monitoring and prediction of fast-changing weather systems like thunderstorms and hurricanes like devastating Hurricane Dorian. We actually see ourselves as being complementary to all of the government satellites and we're excited that they still fly these instruments. They're great, we can calibrate to them, but it's another observation that we don't have to fly. So we're flying in between, we're filling in the gaps to make it a, a more robust observation. CubeSats make it much easier for private companies like OMS to put groundbreaking kit into space. But to really benefit everyone's weather forecast, that data needs to be shared. At the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts in Reading, there are some concerns. As long as we can guarantee that working with these CubeSat providers, we'll have that same open dialogue, that same collaborative spirit and a joint passion to, to make sure these satellite instruments have an impact. And really it's a question for them. Are, are they happy to work in, in this open collaborative environment? Because for us, that is the only way of working. CubeSat technology could have a real positive impact on our ability to monitor and predict the weather. But the tech goes far beyond that. CubeSats are already helping with space exploration to Mars, earthquake detection, and even tracking illegal logging in Kenya. Now, even this weatherman is finding it hard to predict just what the next 20 years of CubeSat technology might bring. I can't wait to find out. That was Peter Gibbs, and that's it for this week. Don't forget we live on social media, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, at BBC Click. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you soon.